The St. Andrews Women's Network was founded in 2010 with the goal of connecting, celebrating, and harnessing the power of the school's alumni through events held both on and off campus. Each year, the Women's Network brings alumni back to campus to reconnect with current students and with each other. These events have expanded into fully co-educational community weekends centered around our alumni sharing their professional paths and, and careers with the school of today. In the past six years, we have sponsored weekends focused on educating girls and boys in the 21st century, women in business and leadership, the Alumni Arts Festival, a celebration of 40 years of co-education, and the Art of Healing, a symposium on science and medicine. This year, we are thrilled to present Inspiring Teachers, a celebration of excellence in education. I want to thank in advance all the alums, parents, and friends who have volunteered their time and expertise and wisdom this weekend. Tad and I are extremely grateful to all of you, most of whom are our former students who have traveled to join us this weekend. We are touched by your willingness to take time out of your really busy lives to return to St. Andrews, and we are incredibly proud of the work you're doing in the world of education. Thank you also to Kathy Mitchell for her deep commitment to an exhaustive work on this weekend. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Emer O'Dwyer back to St. Andrews. She stands out as one of the most brilliant students I've taught during my career here. It's really wonderful to have her here for this weekend on education. Dr. O'Dwyer is Associate Professor of History and East Asian Studies at Oberlin College. An historian of 20th century Japan, she is the author of Significant Soil, Settler Colonialism of Japan's Urban Empire in Manchuria. She is a graduate of Harvard University where she received her bachelor's degree in East Asian Studies and her PhD in History and East Asian Languages. As one of her former teachers, I can say that nothing that, that Dr. O'Dwyer has accomplished and contributed in her life as a scholar and leader surprised me. For even as an applicant to St. Andrews, Emer communicated a love of knowledge and pursuit of wisdom, a reverence for human rights, and a passion for exploration. Emer was born in what she once described as quote, a small town in the Appalachian wilderness of Virginia. She spent the rest of her childhood and adolescence in Milford, Delaware, the daughter of brilliant parents, first generation immigrants to America from Dublin, Ireland. Emer wrote, quote, my parents cultivated in us, she and her brother and younger sister, the same source of familial love concern and devotion inherent in their Irish culture. Family provided the foundation for Emer's, world, Emer's view of the world, approach to education, and approach to the work of her life. She and her mother formed a powerful bond of love and support as Emer realized, even as a young child, that her mother, struggling in a new American culture, found in her daughter Quote, the embodiment of the female roles of the sister she never had and the mother from whom she was separated by 3,000 miles of ocean. Emer described her relationship with her mother in these beautiful words. Quote, since I was very young, I cared for her, talked to her, and loved her. She returned these emotions always unconditionally. From her physician father, Emer learned to the learn the power of grace, kindness, and intellectual curiosity and commitment. She wrote, my father encouraged me to become an influential person who can affect change. St. Andrews was honored to welcome this remarkable young girl to our community, and in a matter of four years, she led and participated and engaged in every aspect of school life. 
She was co-president of the school, a residential leader, a volunteer at Christiana Hospital, a leader in Model UN, Amnesty International, and Model Congress. She was a three-sport varsity athlete, a musician, and a prodigious scholar. Her teachers over the years, including Tad Roach, Dave DeSalvo, Nan Mean, John Higgins, Peter McLean, Eric Kemmer, and I, all described her as one of the most passionate, intelligent, creative, and exciting students of their careers. Certainly, Emer's scholarship throughout her life is amazing, but what makes her stand out from her earliest days as a student is her commitment to changing the world. On her St. Andrews application, she wrote the following statement. I can withstand negative peer pressure in defending others who are being jeered or ridiculed. On an application for a Japan U.S. Senate scholarship program in 1990, she wrote, I firmly believe that anyone who is aware of the inhumane and horrific ways that prisoners of conscience and political prisoners are treated should do all in his or her power to stop this torture. I often become incensed as I write letters imploring governments to definitively end their senseless killing and imprisonment of harmless people. I try not to be discouraged as the perpetrations against humanity continue. Instead, I hope and pray that through the efforts of people like myself, one day people will not be killed or punished simply for stating what they believe in. We are so proud to welcome you back to St. Andrews Emer. Please join me in thanking Dr. O'Dwyer for delivering the keynote address for this extraordinary weekend. I'll have to take a minute, which will require this talk to go on longer. Just to collect myself after what I think is is definitively the most generous, kind, loving introduction I have ever received, and from one of the teachers who has been incredibly inspirational to me over 25 and a half, 26 years. So thank you, Mrs. Williams. recommend to each and every one of you, get yourself introduced by Mrs. Roach. <laughs> That'd be an aspiration. Well, like I say, I'm overcome even much more than I thought I would be, and I knew it would be significant. Um, I have chills here. Uh, it's an extraordinary feeling to be back in an environment that is very much changed externally and not at all internally. So, um, my heart is full, and to that I give thanks to those of you I know and those of you I have yet to meet. It's an honor to be here. My talk is entitled, Something Precious in Every Place, History as Preoccupation and Profession. Twenty-five and a half years ago, I stood in front of the Garth and addressed a crowd similar in size to you here this evening. It was commencement and the mood was, as it always must be, both breathlessly anticipated, I told you. That's Hadley. <laughs> I think, right? <laughs> is she here today? No. But her sister is, I think. Or, and her brother. There you are, hi. <laughs> um, it was commencement and the mood was, as it always must be, both breathlessly anticipatory of the adventures ahead and somberly reflective of all that was being left behind. In my address, I spoke about my six weeks in Japan the previous summer, and especially about the strong bond that had developed between me and my host family, the Katayamas. I spoke of the frustration of a language barrier that did not allow me to give chapter and verse accounting to the Katayamas of all the great relationships both academic and personal, that I was privileged to enjoy at St. Andrews, to enjoy at St. Andrews. In that hot Tokyo July of 1991, my basic point, however, came across loud and clear. I was very 
happy at St. Andrews. My commencement address took this happiness as its main theme as I summed up my feelings by quoting a passage from Evelyn Waugh's 1945 novel, Bride's Head Revisited. Lounging in the beautiful garden of his family's stately manor house, Bride's Head, Sebastian Flight wistfully remarks to his companion, Charles Ryder, I should like to bury something precious in every place where I've been happy. And then when I'm old, and ugly and miserable. I could come back and dig it up and remember. Now returning to campus for only the second time since May 1992, there is no need for trowels, shovels, or X marks the spot. I realize that the something precious is in the faculty lounge, mm -hmm. scattered along the rough hewn paths around the pond, on the field hockey pitch, and per perhaps most of all, lining the library's bookshelves. And I'd hoped so much that they were still there, but unfortunately they are not. The well-stocked, hectic cubby holes that used to be outside the dining hall. Now I see you just throw your backpacks wherever you like. <laughs> <laughs> the books that I read while a student here contain multitudes, and thumbing through weathered copies of them now reveals new truths gone unrecognized by my younger self as meaningful or even prophetic. To name just one example, consider the following passage from George Eliot's Middlemarch, which I read first in Mr. Roach's fifth form English class. <laughs> it comes early in the text as the protagonist, Dorothea, eyes the scholarly Mr. Casaldon as quite possibly representing the solution in one person to her yearning for father, tutor, and mentor. Following a tirade of insipid blathering on patterns of intellectual thought from Dorothea's uncle, Mr. Brooke, from which the gem, the fact is, human reason may carry you a little too far. Over the hedge, in fact. It carried me a good way at one time, but I saw it would not do. I pulled up. I pulled up in time. <laughs> Following this blather, Mr. Casaban reflects on his habit of immersion in historical texts. Eliot describes Casaban's uh, sorry, Eliot describes Dorothea's enchantment. Dorothea said to herself that Mr. Kasabin was the most interesting man she had ever seen. Not accepting even Monsieur Liret, the Vaudois clergyman who had given conferences on the history of the Valdenses. To reconstruct the past world, doubtless with a view to the highest purposes of truth, what a work to be in any way present at, to assist in, though only as a lamp holder. I wish I could say that I had double underlined, highlighted, and starred this passage. But looking back on my vintage copy of the text, handed down from my brother Connor, who, as seen here, and it may be a little hard to read, uh, positioned himself at the center of the universe in what appears to have been an idle moment in class. Uh, and in case you have trouble seeing it, we have here for your delectation, Con oh, uh, sorry. Uh, Connor O'Dwyer, Schmolzy32. Who lives there now? Schmolzy32, anyone? <laughs> Must be a room closet. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> the crowd. I'll send your regards. Keep it clean. Founders Hall, St. Andrew's School, Middletown, Delaware, USA, North America, Earth, Universe. Phil Altsworth, more interview request form. <laughs> so that's actually what Connor was doing. Uh, from this vintage copy, I see that it was Kasabin's self-description in the previous paragraph that attracted my pencil, particularly the line, I live too much with the dead. Clearly, I did not yet share with Dorothea a sense of the personal exaltation to be gained from historical research. However, without giving anything away, it might also be noted that 17-year-old me recognized a crusty and pedantic old codger at first sight. In this regard, at least, I was one step ahead of Dorothea. Literature was my first love at St. Andrews. And it is the works I read in English class that have stayed closest to me over the years. 
The sight of their spines on my bookshelf conjures memories of the most pleasant kind of intellectual stimulation, even if the details of the demanding assignments attached to them don't come as readily to mind. To appropriate William Faulkner's meaning from the inimitable sentence that begins chapter six of Light in August, another staple of the Tad Roach early 90s curriculum, <laughs> memory believes before knowing remembers believes longer than recollects, longer than knowing even wonders. Many happy memories adhere as well to the Latin I, I studied here with Mr. Van Buchum. Attaining the proficiency that allowed me to delight in the literary wordplay of Catullus and Horace, as well as follow the wanderings of Trojan Aeneas, was, I think, in retrospect, a defining, indeed a pulse-quickening moment in my own personal odyssey of fine figuring out what made me tick. And of course, I loved history. With John Lyons as a guide, who could resist it? He's not here anymore, very unfortunately. But his memory, I'm sure, is in the hearts of many others of you. So is there value in excavating the roots of one's career so far back? Or is it merely a tick of the historian, forever preoccupied with patterns and clues to explain the triumph of one course of action over another, the predominance of one set of ideas over another? For me, it matters, because it reminds me of why I approach the writing of history as I do. My primary interests as a historian lie in social, uh, social history and political history as each relates to non-elite members of society. Within the frame of larger national narratives, I'm interested in documenting how political and social change are experienced by individuals far removed from the halls of power. Certainly, some of the inspiration for this social history-centered approach stems from admiration of novelists such as Charles Dickens, Theodore Dostoevsky, and Emile Zola, each of whom documented in meticulous and grippingly readable fashion the lives and hard times of the common man and woman. In my first book, entitled Significant Soil, Settler Colonialism and Japan's Urban Empire in Manchuria, I sought to give life to the texture and rhythms of daily life among those Japanese settlers who occupied Northeast China in the 40 years between Japan's stunning victory over Tsarist Russia in 1905 and its ignominious defeat at the hands of the Allies in August 1945. Parenthetically, the book's title references a line from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, published in the early 1940s, that I loved then and, and love now. In particular, my book explores the social basis of Japanese imperialism in China. Who were the actors whose lives propped up the systems of exploitation that turned China's northeastern region into an abundant source of raw materials, not only for Japan's domestic markets, but also after World War I, for international markets as far afield as Great Britain? Who were the men and women who staffed the enormous and enormously powerful South Manchuria Railway Company, a hybrid half-public, half-private company whose locomotives stocked full of materials for export, chiefly coal and soybeans, crisscrossed China's three northeastern provinces, or Manchuria, as the area was then known to Westerners? Not only that, the for-profit railway company behaved as a colonial authority in its own right, administering schools and hospitals in the region for both Japanese and Chinese residents, as well as managing the major ports linking colony to metropole. How did the company's engineers, switchmen, mechanics, stevedores, coal miners, teachers, doctors, nurses, and accountants live? How did they interact with local Chinese? How did these interactions change as the rise of Japanese militarism after 1931 changed the face of governance in Tokyo as well as colonial operations abroad? To answer these questions and indeed to pose them in the first place, I spent almost a year and a half in Tokyo in the middle of my seven-year path to the PhD. 
With no central archive of colonial materials, I visited university libraries in Tokyo, Osaka, and southwestern Japan, as well as smaller archives scattered throughout the country to find magazines, diaries, and regional newspapers from both Japan and Japanese-occupied China to piece together a picture of life in so-called Japanese Manchuria during the first half of the 20th century. Indispensable tools for conducting research for the book were, of course, the language skills that I have worked since 1992, when I began first-year Japanese language instruction at Harvard, to refine and improve. I learned how to learn a language here at St. Andrews under Mr. Van Buchen's patient tutelage, and I'm happy that the language I've chosen as my main second language continues to provide challenge aplenty. One of my favorite things about the research process is watching a picture slowly develop through the gradual accumulation of materials and the eventual appearance of connections between persons, events, and ideas. It is a long process, of course, and it is easy to get lost in details. But when the big picture begins to emerge, a result, it should be noted, of reading, rereading, thinking, rethinking, and writing, and rewriting, and rewriting again, the feeling of reward at the end of that process is immense. The book finally appeared in print in July 2015, following over a decade of work. Of course, the path of the history PhD is not for everyone, much less the slog of the tenure process that follows for those fortunate enough to secure academic employment. I am aware that 90% of my students at Oberlin College, where I have taught since 2007, will not pursue the study of Japanese history as a profession, and that for probably 75%, there will be no further sustained study of or postgraduate professional experience involving Japan. I'm fortunate the students at Oberlin, and especially those in the East Asian Studies major, are serious about their academic study of Japan, enabling these relatively low, high percentages. So what do I hope students will take away from my classes? What can we hope for students to retain from one four-credit course out of a college career of likely some 32 or more courses? At this stage, I'd like to shift gears and ask you to consider four primary source documents that I use in my two introductory surveys at Oberlin. The first survey, fall semester, which I'm currently teaching, <coughs> papers were due today at 4 p.m. <laughs> while I was in the airplane, considers Japan's pre-modern and early modern periods, roughly 11,000 BCE to 1868 while the spring semester course covers 1868 to 2011. The proto-historic period, uh, the proto-historic period, namely the period before the advent of writing in about 400 CE, is treated with fairly quick dispatch, so that by about one month into the course, we are firmly situated in Japan's medieval period, which we may date from about the late 12th century through the early 16th century. Medieval Japan was, of course, an era of samurai and warfare, but so too was it a vibrant period in the history of Japanese Buddhism. In particular, Zen flourished during these years, having been introduced to Japan from China as a separate school of Buddhism in the late 12th century. The monk Eisai, who lived from 1141 to 1215, was one of the earliest proselytizers of Zen, and it was his advocacy of the new faith that allowed it to gain acceptance, both by the warrior classes, or samurai, who in 1185 had established the government in Kamakura, not far from present-day Tokyo, uh, as well as eventually acceptance by the imperial court in Kyoto. Indeed, it was an effort to convince the emperor and his court to accept this new form of Buddhism that led Asai to write the following lines in 1198, proclaiming the exaltation of Zen teaching and its promise of enlightenment in a single lifetime. So great is mind. Heaven's height is immeasurable, but mind goes above it. Earth's depth is unfathomable, but mind extends beneath it. 
The light of the sun and moon cannot be outdistanced, yet mind reaches beyond them. Galaxies are as infinite as grains of sand, yet mind spreads outside them. How great is the empty space, how primal is the ether. Still, mind encompasses all space and generates the ethereal. Because of it, heaven and earth treat us with their coverage and support. The sun and moon treat us with their circuits, and the four seasons with their transformations. The myriad things treat us with their fecundity. Great indeed is mind. How exciting are these words and how empowering. Your mind, yes, your mind, contains multitudes. Buddhism in Japan, so I teach my students, progressed from one revolutionary development in prescribed practice to another, with the basic premise governing these developments being simplification. An early Buddhist evangelizer instructed his believers to recite the Buddhist prayer of salvation as many times a day as possible. And you can actually clock it and figure out exactly how many times. It's, it's many hundreds of thousands. It's a short prayer. Later, another uh, monk encouraged his followers that just one sincere thought about the Buddha and his in infinite compassion would do, in a, in just one thought in a lifetime would suffice. But it is Zen's complete eschewing of words in the quest for enlightenment that may be said to be at once the simplest and most complex prescription for achieving salvation. The message here to students, aside from what the monks and their lessons reveal about medieval Japan, is the encouragement to trust in and marvel at all that a mind can do. This includes, of course, completing tough problem sets and memorizing French vocabulary, but also providing the capacity to do anything, really anything. You cannot even know rationally how powerful your mind is. This, to me, is a lesson every college student and every high school student should learn. And it must be noted that the universal truth of a size words can be found as well in the writings of our modern thinkers par excellence, such as Vladimir Nabokov, who in a 1950 essay published in the New Yorker noted in a similar vein, how small the cosmos, a kangaroo's pouch would hold it, how paltry and puny in comparison to human consciousness, to a single individual recollection and its expression in words. Consider another lesson, this time from the early 17th century. Here our teacher is Hayashi Razan, 1583 to 1657, a scholar responsible for the establishment of Neo-Confucianism as the official system of instruction for Japan's ruling elites. Neo-Confucianism, a kind of reinterpretation of Confucianism, developed in Song-era China based on the teachings of the 12th century scholar Zhu Xi. Neo-Confucianism had spread to Japan in the 15th century largely through the teachings of Japanese Zen monks, who prided themselves on being studiously au courant with trends in Chinese contemporary philosophy. With the establishment of the Tokugawa warrior government in Japan in 1603, Neo-Confucianism presented itself as a most appropriate ideology for ensuring social harmony and good government. And so Hayashi Razan became Neo-Confucian tutor to the first four Tokugawa shoguns. He taught them, as well as their samurai retainers, the importance of the five relationships between ruler and subject, father and son, husband and wife, uh, elder brother and younger brother, and friend and friend. He also taught them the three virtues essential to every human being. Number one, wisdom. Number two, humaneness. And number three, courage. And in setting the regulations for the schooling of children and young people, he prescribed a course of five steps. Number one, study widely. Number two, question thoroughly. 
Number three, deliberate carefully. Four, analyze clearly. And five, act conscientiously. I might well end my talk here, since what more can I say that is not encompassed in these Neo-Confucian teachings? What greater evidence is needed to demonstrate how the teaching of history can and should be a civilizing act? But there are two more examples that I want to give you from my curriculum, each drawn from my field of expertise, the 20th century. The first regards the Allied air raids on Tokyo on the night of March 9th, 1945, which saw the deaths of 100,000 Tokyoites, upon whom were dropped 1,665 tons of incendiary bombs. 100,000 deaths in just one night of bombing. How many people died in the atomic bombing of Hiroshima three months later? Estimates generally fall in the 90,000 range, though of course many tens of thousands died in the weeks, months, and years after as a result of radiation poisoning. Another 75,000 died on August 9th in Nagasaki. But Tokyo in one night experienced 100,000 deaths. These were, of course, not all military deaths, far from it. The U.S. Army Air Forces conducted a 10-day-long assault in mid-March 1945, targeting six of the nation's largest urban areas in which civilians, not arsenals or weapon factories, but civilians were the primary target. In those 10 horrific days, Japan experienced bomb tonnage of nearly half that used in bombing campaigns in Germany throughout the war to date, in just 10 days. Indeed, as early as November 1942, the U.S. Office of Strategic Services commissioned theme maps showing the most inflammable areas of those six largest cities. These maps, which displayed each city's geography, and here we see Tokyo, with color coding to point out the most densely populated and therefore most inflammable areas led experts in Washington to anticipate quick destruction and the laying to waste of over 200 square miles throughout Japan and fatalities approaching half a million persons. By war's end, not six, but 66, cities throughout Japan had experienced incendiary bombing. It must, of course, be noted that the Japanese government in Tokyo, dominated by military elites since the ascension to the prime ministership of General Tojo Hideki in 1941, bore some responsibility for the suffering of the Japanese people. Much responsibility, indeed. To cite just two concrete examples, in early March 1945, in anticipation of an aerial bomb firebombing of Tokyo, officials issued prohibitions against people abandoning their houses completely as they evacuated to the countryside. Someone, <coughs> authorities declared, must stay so as to prevent fires from spreading throughout neighborhoods. Such advice was similar in its naivete as orders issued in newspapers in the three days between the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings in August. Orders which recommended that people continue their resistance against the Anglo-American enemy from within temporary shelters in caves until the use of this, quote, new kind of bomb had been suspended. To return to the case of firebombing, after the hellish night of March 9th, officials in Tokyo allowed only army members and public servants to buy train tickets to escape the burning ruins. Leaving aside the culpability for Japan's ruinous defeat, of, uh, defeat in war by General Tojo, sorry, leaving aside the culpability for Japan's ruinous defeat, uh, by General Hitojo, Emperor Hirohito, and other leaders, how do we teach the experience of suffering in war, especially when it so heavily involves civilians? 
Writing about the destruction by fire of German cities, particularly Hamburg and Dresden, between 1943 and 1945, German novelist W.G. Zebald asked in a 2002 New Yorker article, how ought such a natural history of destruction begin? With a summary of the technical, organizational, and political prerequisites for carrying out large-scale raids, with a scientific account of the previously unknown phenomenon of the firestorms, with a pathological record of typical modes of death, or with behaviorist studies of the instincts of flight and homecoming. How indeed? Covering such material adequately in a classroom is difficult work. Covering it in a survey lecture is well nigh impossible. I once saw a professor in a large lecture course on modern European history cover the Holocaust in the very short time he had within that lecture simply by showing the slides of some of the camps and the atrocities committed within them. He said nothing, standing in silence as he advanced the slides. While I understand the professor's dilemma, it's, it's next to impossible to say anything meaningful about the Holocaust in two to three minutes, his example provides a good contrast to the only way unspeakable events, and here we include the Tokyo firebombing and other atrocities of World War II, including, of course, those committed by Japanese soldiers and imperialists. The only way such unspeakable events can meaningfully be grasped is by slow, careful, committed, and conscientious discussion. The study of the humanities reveals its enduring value in its commitment to providing the intellectual framework for these discussions. So let me conclude with a final example, uh, perhaps more familiar to, uh, to some of you, I hope, um, and that is uh, with regard to the extremely popular Japanese contemporary novelist Murakami Haruki. So in 1996, Murakami conducted interviews with survivors of the March 1995 sarin gas attacks on the Tokyo subway system conducted by the religious cult Om Shinrikyo. The effort culminated in a volume entitled Underground, which was published in Japan in 1997. The unadorned voices of the victims represented a searing indictment of the calculated savagery of the attacks that left 12 people dead and many thousands more struggling with a range of maladies ranging from eye damage to depression to post-traumatic stress disorder. One impetus for, compi for compiling the voices and publishing them, Murakami has explained, was his frustration at what he viewed as obsessive media coverage of the perpetrators, and, almost, and an almost complete negation of the victims and their suffering from the historical record. Murakami considered it completely out of the question to include in underground any of the cult members' voices or descriptions of their motivations. Yet as Underground climbed to the top of bestsellers lists in Japan in 1997, something common to all of his books uh, and for the fans out there, there is a new book, a new novel that just came out last year awaiting or being translated as we speak, so hold steady. Uh, Murakami re reconsidered his decision to, ex in 1997, he reconsidered his decision to exclude own voices from public airing and analysis. Why should they not, too, have to provide a frank accounting of what led them to do what they had done? And so Murakami sought out cult members, not an easy process, of course, when many were under indictment, and conducted face-to-face -face interviews similar to those he had conducted a year earlier with victims. There was, however, one essential difference. In interviewing the victims, Murakami had adopted the role of basically just a microphone. He let the victims talk, hardly interjecting with questions or any kind of editorializing. He wanted them to structure their own thoughts, build their own narratives. 
With all members, however, Murakami adopted an active role, jumping in to question assertions made, challenge presumed logic, or otherwise react to the beliefs forwarded by the young, mostly university-educated elite who comprised much of the cult's leadership. Consider his conversation with one Kano Hiroyuki, a pen name, who, who had served in Ohm's Ministry of Science and Technology at the time of the attacks in March 95. Following an extended discussion by Kano, in which he described how his growing interest in Buddhism as a teenager coincided with an increasing skepticism to anything that could not be objectively proven. Kano declares, I'm not much interested in things that can't be measured scientifically. What cannot be measured has no persuasive power. So whatever value it might have can't be transmitted to other people. Murakami challenges Kano by pointing out the data might differ depending on one's viewpoint, and that data can be manipulated, measuring instruments can be out of whack, etc., etc. Kano remains unmoved, at which point Murakami conjectures, I don't imagine you read novels. <laughs> Kano admits as much, and Murakami replies, since I'm a novelist, I'm the opposite of you. I believe that, that what's most important cannot be measured. I'm not denying your way of thinking, but the greater part of people's lives consists of things that are unmeasurable. And trying to change all of these to something measurable is realistically impossible. I'm with Murakami. We learn to live and love and empath empathize through reading literature. When we study other languages and learn unusual, to us at least, novel turns of phrase, we exult in the million different ways human brains work in, able, in enabling us to communicate. We grasp the delicacy and strength of the human form and what it can achieve when we admire art. We learn what tragedy is through our knowledge of history, though interpretation must always take us one step beyond mere fact. We are empowered by our ability for reason, knowing that it can never take us too far when we are tethered by our best humanistic impulses. We are not, after all, Mr. Brooke from Middlemarch, who, as I mentioned at the start of this talk, George Eliot introduces to us in all his foppery and all her wisdom, uh, by summoning the absolute silliest of claims. The fact is, human reason may carry you a little too far over the hedge, in fact, blah de blah <laughs> Robots, drones, name the latest technological innovation, they all can perform calculations, but they do not know how to value the meaning of what they produce, or indeed, what they destroy. So celebrate the power of your mind, as 12th century monk Asai would have you do. Investigate all things in the matter of the Neo-Confucians. Demonstrate your devotion to righteous acts. Be good to your teachers, parents, siblings, and friends. These two are at the core of Neo-Confucian ethics. Read literature and talk about it. Practice your French, Spanish, or Chinese with a native speaker. Read history and talk about it. Be curious. And finally, find something precious in each place. Thank you.
thank you so much, Emer. You've given us so much to think about. Um, I think Emer will take some questions. professor who introduced the Holocaust in just a couple slides, you mentioned how this wasn't a great way to address the situation. And so when you talk about the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what are the best ways in which we can introduce them if we don't have the proper way? It's an excellent question, and it's extremely difficult also, but that's not an answer that I won't do in this setting, um, <laughs> nor should it. I. I went to Hiroshima last year for the first time in 20 plus years. Um, I was teaching in Kyoto as part of a study abroad program at Oberlin um, that is also shared in a consortium at Carlton Smith, uh, Mount Holyoke, and a bunch of other places. Many of you are probably applying, so do sign up um, when you get there. But uh, we went to uh, Hiroshima and brought the students, and again, I saw the powerful um, physical space in which the uh, skeleton of one of the buildings uh, still remains and has been memorialized as a, uh, to have all of the visitors from all over the world who come see what this did and get some sense for the force of the blast. I saw, to the museum uh, in which there are very uh, moving artifacts of the victims uh, of that attack, such as broken uh, eyeglasses, um, burnt uh, kimono, um, personal effects that have been ravaged by the fire and indeed burned away from the skin of those wearing them, and many other things in that museum. But of course, not everyone can make it to Hiroshima um, for a reason of resource, time, what have you. So how in a classroom do you teach this? I, um, there's certainly no exact method. Um, given my predilections, I try to use literature and film uh, as important um, testaments to the, to the destruction. Uh, one book in particular that is very moving is one known as uh, Kuroi Ame in Japanese, or Black Rain, which chronicles uh, a a uh, young girl who is exposed to the radiation, um, who's quite near the center of the blast in Hiroshima, uh, and then experiences radiation sickness over the uh, months that follow. And as a result, she and her family also experience much discrimination from other Japanese who see her as, uh, number one, not a good marriage partner, given the supposed, uh, uh, the very likely irradiation of her uh, chromosomes uh, for uh, reproduction purposes. Um, so looking at how Japanese themselves discriminated against uh, these people who were unfortunate to be in that place at that time. I show also a film uh, by a French director, uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, from 1956, I believe, which is a very moving um, uh, uh, evocation of Hiroshima, filmed in Hiroshima you know, 11 years after, after the blast, um, that, that includes a whole different set of issues. Um, so, of course, we can teach the statistics, the numbers, which is what I trotted out for you in, in the, uh, uh, for expedience sake here, um, but that's only, that's really so little of the picture, uh, that we need to, I think there is an imperative that we understand what nuclear uh, technology and weaponry can do, uh, how it works, and what it what it re what it uh, what it the damage the enormous incalculable damage it causes. But we also need to um, to really listen to the experience of the people in Japan who experienced this twice, and to hear what they have to say, and to look very closely at the extreme anti-militarism that most people in Japan feel. Currently in Japan, we have quite a conservative prime minister who has just won another big election, um, who is very much in line with US demands for Japan to rearm 
Uh, you may know that in Japan's post-war constitution, it has um, renounced the uh, capacity to wage war as a means of settling international disputes. And that Article 9, as it's known, is considered um, to be the heart of Japan's post-war constitution and something fiercely guarded, um, certainly by anyone who remembers, who's old enough to remember the destruction of the war, but also, uh, fortunately, by younger generations who do not want to um, have their nation get thrust into the calamity that it was thrust into during the wartime years, precisely because leaders were not listening then. So all of those lessons are very timely. Uh, we also should add that the survivors of the bomb are now uh, well into their 80s and 90s, uh, and they're dwindling and dying fast. So I think that they have an experience unlike anything anyone else can possibly imagine. And to hear them speak, whether you Google them on YouTube or what have you, uh, is very powerful. Um, but we need to hear those voices and consider to act conscientiously, to investigate widely, to do all those things the Neo-Confucian said in, for any topic, but I think right now in this moment in our nation's history, in the world's history, we need to, to know the damage and, and to investigate it and think carefully. Thank you for your question. Hello. Hi. Being Japan, as I've studied it, as and I know, it has always been a very male-dominant and uh, uh, world structure and uh, history and continues to be. So, you being a woman a historian, how have you like what happened? What uh, well, what what has been your take on it? How do you study it, and what effect has that had on you? Thank you, another very thoughtful question. Um, the first thing to pop to mind on a weekend such as this is that I had, I was lucky to have uh, during my, uh, the year and a half I mentioned spending in Tokyo doing dissertation research. One of the greatest teachers alongside those I know in this room, uh, I was fortunate enough to have as my research mentor in Japan, a Japanese professor um, who incidentally, <laughs> Just, this is such a great aside, I have to say it. Uh, his first name, uh, his last name is Yanagisa, which means um, uh, sort of a stream by the willow. It's a very lyrical, beautiful, poetic name in Japanese. But his first name is the, for those of you studying Chinese, I know you're out there, um, think of the character for to play. Actually, I think it's not used as much in Chinese, but it's um, Yu is the character. Ask your Chinese teacher later. Uh, but that's his first name in Japanese, it, the verb to play. Uh, so very often you have Japanese male names are a verb of some kind, but typically there's something solemn like to study, to persevere, to work hard, uh, is just a single character name, but this is actually to play. Uh, anyway, he's a delightful person as his name promised, and he, I think, treated me um, as not only his only foreign graduate student, but also a female graduate student with no without even the slightest suggestion of difference from his all-male uh, mid-twenty-something graduate students and uh, was exemplary in that regard. Um, so I was fortunate, I think. Um, of course, Japan has all sorts of gender discrimination. Indeed, I teach a whole course on it in a seminar at Oberlin on discrimination in modern Japan. Not just gender, but certainly including. That said, I think that whenever we look at another society and think, you know, scratch our heads and say that they, ha they don't have this right in that society, it's not equal. We need to scratch the other side of our head and look at that problem in our own society. And I think that the U.S. has a very long way to go, um, and the gains will be made by people like yourselves in demanding equal pay for equal work, which was a big passion of mine when I was a student here uh, with the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, but demanding that women who are your peers, who are your friends, who are your girlfriends, what have you, um, get the same treatment uh, they do here in the classroom. I saw that today in Mrs. Roach's class, um, for sure, male and female, doesn't matter, you're treated the same. But we need to make sure that that follows into society, so into U.S. contemporary society. But I don't mean that as an evasion of the question. For certain, there are issues regarding gender. I have been very fortunate that I've never been on the bad side of things. Thank you for your 
Um, when did you know that you had such a deep passion for East Asian studies and particularly what led you on your path to be have eventually have a doctorate degree in these studies and to be able to teach in Oberlin College? Yeah. Thank you, Samir. I met Samir over dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Um, yeah, I mean, it comes back to St. Andrews and these are not answers tailored for this audience. I went after my junior year in the program that Mrs. Roach described um, and I went to Tokyo and lived in this part of Tokyo that was not actually badly damaged by the fire bombings. It was one area that um, remarkably uh, did in 1991 still have um, sort of old Japanese houses from the 1920s. Indeed, the one I lived in was from 1926, I think, that had just sort of miraculously escaped fire bombing. Um, on, on this map, it, on this map, it is. So these parts here, this is Tokyo, these parts here are the areas that were mar targeted as most densely populated and therefore most inflammable. Um, uh, and I lived, uh, the place I was in was right next to Tokyo University, actually, and somewhere in here. But um, it was a neighborhood, because it had been spared these bombings, that retained a, a tremendous amount of the kind of charm that adhered to this neighborhood in Tokyo from the pre-war years. It was close to Tokyo University. It was home to a lot of Japanese uh, famous literary figures uh, who wrote uh, lovingly about this area, um, and you could see much of that even still in 1991. So I think the whole experience was um, was enchanting. I started uh, freshman year in college uh, about 18 months later and started with Japanese language, and the <laughs> thrill of it, I think, is what kept me going. It was extremely difficult. Um, but it, I knew it was something that would not exhaust itself in terms of challenge. <laughs> I was right about that. Um, so I was fortunate. Uh, East Asian Studies was my college major, um, and that was a multidisciplinary major, like some you will see in college. Um, but I didn't come to the love for history as much during college. It was more trying to get the language down and uh, sort of figuring out how literature would work into things. Uh, and then I took time off um, after college. Uh, not really time off since I went to San Francisco and worked at the Japanese consulate there, um, the Japanese um, uh, Foreign Service Office in San Francisco, and uh, just continued the passion. But I read, I investigated widely. I read as much as I could now that I didn't have curriculums to tell me what to read. And I found my interest gravitating toward history because I felt that it was something that would enable me to use my language skills, that it would enable me to write a lot. And frankly, as someone who tended to be, and I guess still does tend to be, more on the reserved side of things, um, that I didn't want to be a political scientist or anthropologist because you had to go out and talk to people all the time. <laughs> and I thought it was maybe more suited to my personality to stay in a library and read all the time. <laughs> and I'm proud to say that. <laughs> and I think I was right. So I think matching your personality to your career can be a good, a good thing to try to think about. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, hi. Something that we've been talking about in our history classes is um, how do you view at societal norms from a contemporary viewpoint, so something that a society may have viewed as okay back then that we now would have a moral um, viewpoint that says that that would not be okay, and how do you balance that? Um, and I was just wondering if you had any opinions on that. Right. It's funny that when you ask that and you said art history, my mind, you said art history, right? No. Oh. Art history class, just in general. Art history, yeah. Um, yeah, right, but the thing that I, I heard art history, so I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I still didn't hear what you said, sorry, there's like a sound vacuum over there. Um, so, in Japanese art history, <laughs> polarity ensued. <laughs> Japanese art history, there are, in Japanese art in the particularly 18th century, woodblock prints, right? We're super uh, 
popular mode of expression. And some of them were very, shall we just say, racy, right? <laughs> Maybe you know of what I speak. Um, but extremely uh, um, graphic descriptions of human sexuality, both uh, hetero and homosexuality. And as 21st century viewers, in all our urbaneness, I think we still look at a lot of those prints and think, oh my god. That's too much for my 21st century sensibilities. So in a way, it's kind of the flip of what you were just saying, that there, um, people in, uh, in what is now Tokyo had thoughts about sexuality and gender relations and gender fluidity, particularly. Uh, more sophisticated, I would say, <laughs> if sophisticated is the right word to describe them being one way or the other, um, than we do today in our Society, so that's kind of the flip of what you asked. But um, gender, I mean, to return to gender, we certainly can look at um, the way women were treated uh, in the pre-1868 period, when women were not given ready access to education or literacy to be able to read. Um, and we can certainly um, sort of thumb our noses at that or say, why weren't women entitled to read, but I think those kind of moralistic or sort of subjective analyses of it only get us so far. It's more important to look at the historical reasons for why it wasn't the case and also to unearth the cases where it was the case. Um, because very often you will find in history things are never black or white, right? There are shades of variation to any question or any subject of investigation. Thank you so much, Dr. Dwyer.